What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Zesty Viking, and here we are again, Unhinged Podcast, and we have a special guest for today. Uh, Wolfie, would you would you like oh, to the one, the only, give Zesty a hard boner the size of the Sears Tower? The <laughs> one, the only, my. <laughs> How was that? Sorry, guys. I apologize for you. You peaked years. yourself. <laughs> you just peaked. That's great. Um, hello. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess we could start this off with uh, it's been kind of credited towards you to be called Metal Moses. Uh, you want to kind of explain that nickname, sir? So it was uh, from a local magazine in Cleveland, Ohio, that is actually been around forever. And every city has one of these, the basically the, the free trade magazines that has your concert listings and advertisements for food. And when you need a hand job for $30 for with a, some hair gel, it's on the back page, I guess. I don't know. Um, the, <laughs> but yeah, we would... Uh, <laughs> Live nudes here. Yeah, exactly. We... We played a concert in Cleveland, and it was uh, right when we were starting to kind of make some notoriety and impossibility of reason was it just about to come out. And I brought like an old school hardcore trick to the uh, metal world, which was the wall of death. And nobody was really doing that in the metal scene at the time. And uh, so I did that. And then in the review for the show, the the journalist referred to me, you know, what I had done as like uh, Moses splitting the Red Sea and then it was such. So he called me like a heavy metal Moses. And so it was a good way for me to not just call it like the wall of death from the hardcore scene. Uh, it kind of gave me like a unique flair to it, uh, you know, kind of something catchy, you know, to remember it by besides just a wall of death. I have one question about that. Did you strike the stone or did you talk to it then as you were parting the Red Sea? Man, no, I, you know, <laughs> I was, uh, some, you know, I always I say this, but like my favorite thing was when I asked the crowd, do you know what Moses did? And like, I, I just heard some go, he smoked weed. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my favorite answer for <laughs> Besides parting the red sea i only know moses and the ten commandments i only know moses for his weed consumption <laughs> uh so what went through your head um uh being crowd voted uh, uh for for uh farm club in like the early 2000s what was yeah. that like and do you believe that might have kickstarted the future of chimera it it put it into overdrive is what it did we had a we were kind of lucky at the time that we were all already being courted, if you will, from, from various record labels. And that appearance basically sealed the deal. And we knew that not only would we get signed, but then the offers would be better and more lucrative. So we were excited for that. Uh, going through our mind, we were very appreciative. Um, we kind of got l like lucky as well, because one of the people that worked behind the scenes on the show was not only a, a fan but a friend and nice. uh, i think uh you know it's, it's okay to say 20 years later we kind of got on there the uh <laughs> it's, it's not what you do it's who you know it's who you know way exactly um <laughs> but uh so we were very grateful that we you know we were put into that opportunity and it, it was very surreal because we were a a new band that you know the the biggest luxury we ever had experienced on a concert before was getting like some shitty cheese after show pizza <laughs> so to be like basically taken into the universal studios back lot given riders and you know tons of food and you're hanging out with all these celebrities and free passes to the park and this and that i mean we were treated like you know like just like any other top band was at the, on the day so you know our minds you know we were fucking slayer that day <laughs> Fuck <yeah. laughs> top of the tier right there yeah, that's how it felt right they put us there and the show the performance itself is a little weird and awkward especially what the fans got to see um because uh we actually 
try to sneak two songs in and at the end of dead inside we went into severed and like mm -hmm. kind of played like a whole like breakdown part of it and mm -hmm. we go off crazy and uh which is another reason i'm like so winded and uh that i was always embarrassed i'm like god ah, man i look so winded from i wasn't doing anything at the end of dead inside <laughs> 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 it was so I'm crazy good. during severed but uh, they cut that out, uh, and um, right, you know, obviously we tried to pull a fast one and it didn't work. But uh, <laughs> that was for the fans, you know. We wanted to give them something sweet. Um, but uh, it was weird because they had a lot of hired models in the crowd, and which is another thing you can see when you watch the performance. And it's like these uh, girls that are trying to like dance, but we're like, you know, playing <laughs> auto. Da, 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 da. They don't know what the fuck they're doing to do it. Do it. And um, so that was just funny. Uh, the first few, we, we didn't do it first take either. Like it's one of those situations where like first take fucking, I think it was Jim maybe, or maybe he's a second take, but the fucking wireless just, you know, he jumps and the wireless just flies out <laughs> to the crowd. <laughs> one guy the string breaks or something dumb you know it, it, it's a constant series of like mistakes before we finally take off and play the actual performance it's, it's funny, funny that you mentioned the models being in there it's like i, I get this like uh the Go -go sesame dancers. street no i get this sesame street thing going one of these things is not <laughs> like the other <laughs> absolutely absolutely they were there for mandy moore i suppose you know which is another weird thing like oh my I, God. we can say like yeah, we played that one show with Manny Moore, Green Day, and Incubus. It's like, huh? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is going to be kind of a weird one here because, you know, touring seems like such a unique lifestyle. Um, And now you're on Twitch. What is the uh, – are you enjoying it more than touring? Or do you ever miss the road? Oh, they're two different animals, but in one weird way, they 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 kind of line up in a in a for a, this. I would say like the comparison would be like after show or maybe pre show, if you get some friends from out of town okay. or friends from that city, and you're hanging out with them on the bus and just having a good time, listening to music, telling jokes. They're there because they like the band as well. But they're also there because they like you and they're there to have a good time. I would say that's like the comparison of Twitch and the moments of tour. Uh, but of course, I enjoy being at home and and not having to deal with the 23 hours of, wow, man, I wonder what the fuck I'm going to do for 23 hours. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit, quote unquote, better. Uh, do I miss touring? I, not at the moment, but uh, but what was weird is when I played with uh, that concert with Lamb of God uh, earlier <laughs> this year, when I showed up, I was like, oh, it's kind of like you f you slip back into your costume and you're like, oh, yeah, this is this is what I do and this is how it feels and it's normal. And you don't I don't I didn't have this anxiety that I would if I had time to think about it. Did you ever do uh, Zesty told me you have done uh like just you singing on stream would you ever do a full band show on stream and just run like that like a mini concert would that be something you'd ever even kind of like about? a kind of like psycho stick yeah i'm i'm open to many ideas i think that um that that kind of idea though is was really suited best for the pandemic and i don't know that it's still exciting I can't say for sure. Um, I think people would prefer to see it live, but I think what, what would happen maybe is if we were able to play live, we could perhaps figure out a way to stream it for those that can't attend. Because I do like people being able to see it, especially if they're in another country or something. Um, but solely just streaming, uh, I don't think anyone in the band would be interested in that because it doesn't feel... Uh, the same out of all of your albums because you have a plethora of albums man from this present <laughs> darkness all the way to crowns which one was your absolute favorite to work on and means the most to you hmm. i enjoyed working on the infection album just because <laughs> there was a lot of uh 
there was just a lot of good vibes writing it a lot of we were just having a good time we were on tour while we were writing it the tour itself was a lot of fun we were out with death clock and we'd never really nice. been on the road before so we were utilizing the fact that we could all have like you know the portable studios at this point in the technology now so we're like hell like instead of just dicking around on tour we can spend the time writing and it was just a good vibe and i had a lot of fun doing it then when it came time to actually make the album i enjoyed it um i like the songs on that meaning um hmm i don't know man they all it's all different because then that's like I think that's like one of those child questions. It's like, hey, what's your favorite child uh, in that <laughs> regard? Which one do you love the most? Uh, I mean, there's there's kids I don't like. <laughs> Some of my kids I don't like. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you still got to like, you know. They're not all cute. Some of them right, just, you yeah, know, yeah. sorry, your kid's not cute. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like, this, you know. There was a lot of music from General Midwest, from Ohio, yeah. Illinois, and then of course Iowa right at that time. Do you feel did you feel like that was like a giant push and there was something in the water at that time that was kind of pushing everyone up at that point? Um it's interesting. I don't know because of like the the awareness factor meaning when I'm a teenager and in school and stuff I'm going to going to concerts and my variety we were lucky in Cleveland at the time we would get everything. So I could go see a band like Slayer, but I could also go see a band like Integrity, who's like just killing the underground hardcore scene. So I get perspective either from like an arena or like, whoa, this is a sold out 300 seater and everyone's just going insane, jumping off the stages and everything like that. Um, it what drove me from those seeing these things and especially like bands like Integrity or Ringworm who were local and doing the same things what I consider like what Slayer were doing, I didn't really understand the perception of like, you know, like, oh, the Slayer's way bigger. I, and it, to me, they're just all great bands and they play concerts at these venues. I don't understand like who's bigger and who's not. But what it drove me to be like, man, I just want to do that. And I want to like be on the same stages as those bands. So seeing Integrity and Ringworm, I'm like, well, they're from Ohio, they're from Cleveland. That means I can do this too. And I literally took on that attitude that it was that easy, <laughs> uh, which is ridiculous. But it's this cockiness, I don't think I would have now, but that cockiness was like, I think gave me the insanity and ability to, to really like take it seriously and push it and be like, this is what we're gonna do. The awareness of the movement comes after the fact and you're like oh shit you know you start playing regional shows and you're like oh this cool band is is doing something similar but they got this little twist of it or we'd go to new england and you're like fuck on earth shadows fall we were yes. playing with these bands before they are uh signed either or god forbid came to cleveland before they're signed um yeah no one should go to cleveland ever <laughs> yeah i agree uh but the this camaraderie starts like once we're doing it and then like the internet for us is still kind of in its infancy so we're just discovering like oh shit we're not the only ones and that's cool we can like talk to these other bands and maybe we can trade shows and, and it's kind of developed it, it, it developed very organically and we utilize the tools that of the time that were all like basically new and it just kind of took like the right attitude of like i can do this you know who was your biggest hero and got to actually tour with? And also, did they meet your expectations of like, wow, man, these these guys are my my God, this is such a dumb question. <laughs> wow, these guys are my heroes. You know, like this is this is why I love them. Ah, uh, it's hmm, that's a good question in the sense that like, I, I'm shy and I I don't really know how to. So I'm socially awkward. So I would always be intimidated by meeting heroes, if you will. <clears throat> um, but it basically, you could just start right off the rip with, you know, Slayer and Carrie King. Slayer uh, is the band that I first he heard that gets me into metal. And our very first major tour then is with them. 
so this is kind of like one of these like what the f you know like pinch me you know uh it's just real moments and i remember jim and i uh lamarca we were sitting there watching their sound check and he and i just started busting out laughing <laughs> and we were laughing because we're like what the fuck are we doing here we don't belong here but it, it, from their perspective slayers it probably looked like we're like are they talking shit about us <laughs> like, you know, like, uh but then like we meet carrie like pretty much immediately and he just like defuses any sort of like hey i'm a rock star like thing you might have in your head and he's just like immediately treating you like family and like hey bro let's go do a shop like he knows us forever and this sort of mentality you're like for me pers personally, some of the guys in my band just like grab it. Oh yeah, hey Gary, let's do some shots. And I'm still the shy guy that's, I can't believe this is happening. And I don't really know how to, what to say that I don't want to ask questions that are stupid. Uh, it, Jim though gets the best dumb question award because he asked if his uh, <laughs> Carrie's house was shaped like a pentagram. <laughs> <laughs> and even Carrie was like, what the fuck is wrong with you, bro? You know, like, <laughs> that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. The uh, the funniest Slayer thing I ever heard from Carrie, like, I got to stay at his house, and he uh, told me that one time a fan found out where he lived. He's like, Sunday morning, doorbell rings at 8 a.m. <laughs> the door, and there's someone just goes, Slayer! <laughs> <in> his... <laughs> oh, man, I would have shot the guy. What advice that was given to you by maybe another musician that you used dearly on the road and actually you still use today? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know that there's like an advice column memory of mine. I think like, like it's kind of weird that we're all, I don't want to say everyone's out for themselves, but everyone keeps a lot of the business to themselves i guess in the early stages i could i could go back to like spine shank uh Ooh. essentially warning us about roadrunner mm. <laughs> the uh, like just and labels in general but like what our perceived notion of being signed to roadrunner would be like versus what it would actually be like i don't know if that's advice as much as it is like I guess it's advice, but they were all also giving us like a warning. It felt more like than <laughs> advice. Like, yo, their advice is take the deal, but this is what's going to happen kind of thing. So it's more like eye opening what what being on a record label is like. And, and our generation is the last generation where record labels are still fair to bands in the sense that we never had to do deal with like a 360 deal or whatever else would be common in in 2022 i have no idea but that was the thing that came about after our generation and that's basically when a label owns a piece of everything that you do three singers vocalists doesn't matter genre anything who are they it's lane staley i love okay his voice. uh Devin Townsend, I love his voice. Man, I just got to give it to Papa Het, man. Hetfield, yeah, like I mean, it's just so perfectly metal, and <laughs> he can, he can just he has the range and the command and the hand of the fucking picking downstroke, man. So I give it to him. Oh yeah. Oh, I still yeah. remember the one time I saw Strapping Young Lads, oh. and it's still when Townsend had hair. I think it was actually them and Mashuga, and he just looks at the crowd, and at one point he's like, "This here." Is a skullet, <laughs> nothing on top. All party in the back. I was, I was just like, I didn't realize I didn't. I didn't leave the metal genre so much or hard rock. So I have to give it to Michael Jackson. I always forget yes. that, like, that's like the best singer of all time. But uh, other than that, yeah. Mm. I, I guess oh, go so. listen to fucking Jackson Five, bro. Put I... that in your headphones. Take a big rip and be like, what the fuck? Because that yeah. dude. <laughs> He will blow your mind. All oh. the, whole, the whole catalog. If you really pay attention to what the fuck that guy's doing, it's scary. Same with Prince, man. Like guitar, though, on guitar. I'll, I'll give you Prince. I'll give you Prince, Prince for sure. On guitar, scariest dude alive. 
Is that yeah. to go back and listen to Dirty Diana from Michael Jackson? I yeah, I feel I, ways I have, about things. I have, but actually, I think Shaman's Harvest did a great job covering that song. Go listen to ABC. What would be some conditions to ever get Chimera back in the studio? What would what would it take for Chimera to come back? Uh, desire from people in the band. Hmm. Like so, there's a lot of. Uh, a, hey, we've kind of already done all that. So, but then there's B, hey, I have a really great career and I make a ton of money and I don't need to leave my home. Whereas last time I was in that band, uh, it was kind of fucking rough. So there's, it's tough to get people excited about things, especially <clears throat> when it just seems like, uh, uh, well, it was a volatile situation for two years. Obviously now it's it's fine. We were hoping to do another show um, but that got the kibosh once everybody went inside for a couple of years. Would you do a solo one at this point then? No, no. my <laughs> eggs are, my eggs are in the, the chimera basket. It's just one of those things where I would prefer to do it with the people that I enjoy doing it with in the band, you know, the awesome, as much yeah. as the classic lineup as we can get. You've brought up hardcore a lot. How much did that influence chimera? And you were almost kind of at a pinnacle age when it was probably one of its biggest times. And you mentioned Earth Christ, you mentioned Ringworm. I was like, I know who that is. <laughs> How much did that come over Huge. to Chimera? Huge. I would say in the beginning, um, very much that's all the only kind of bands we played with, you know, in the club scenes. And that's the type of bands we wanted to play with. So I thought it would be interesting if you will, to be more of a metal band and have different type of dynamics like uh, keyboards and things and bring that into the hardcore scene where it's a little taboo, but be <laughs> hardcore enough the way we looked and, and sounded and the gear we're using and our pedigree. We came from hardcore bands. So like people knew our uh, Jason Hagar from Ascension, who was well known in the hardcore scene. And then my band uh, and Jim's band uh, was Skipline, who we did a somewhat regional, uh, I wouldn't call it success, but people knew us in the hardcore scene. So we're able to use this pedigree to kind of sneak in, like, hey, we're going to play with Zeo, or hey, we're going to play this show with integrity. And we belong here because we have a pedigree, and but we're playing different shit. And uh, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but we we kind of steered away from the Cleveland metal scene, which As we all should, we hit, which we thought was a click. So it was like mushroom head and then like there are 30 bands <laughs> and we didn't want to do anything, not any respect to all those guys, but like, yeah. we didn't want to be a part of that. We wanted to kind of like make, make the hardcore scene. I don't know, a little different, but then like, it just became apparent that we were, you know, then like we were like, well, what if we start playing with these new metal bands? Because that's like, we're really heavy and we'll shit all over <clears> them. <throat> <laughs> <laughs> we kind of have, have new metal elements too. And we, and that's, that's like, a, you know, a mix of like, hey, man, we like Earth Crisis, but we like corn. And 94, man, that's kind of what you listen to if you're, if you're our age. So yep. we play like a Earth Crisis riff, but detuned and it like gives us a quote unquote unique thing that we kind of have going on. Uh, in our minds anyway yeah <laughs> so but that's that's the way we were kind of approaching it yeah there was a there was a huge like change between you had passed out of existence which was like more more towards like the new metal scene and then out of nowhere impossibility of reason which was like bitch we're metal yeah fuck you <laughs> you know like it, it was such a staple of an album dude like oh my god what uh what changed what made that pivot um, well, there's, I, I tend to say in the press that it's kind of a reaction to the new metal tag, but there's, there's a little more to that and like a little more nuance to it that I don't think ever really gets flushed out when a magazine comes out or something. But, um, I think when we were writing pass out, we are writing quote unquote hits, try, well, at least what we're trying to do anyway, songs that have like memorable hooks and the song structure is a little easier to, to digest, if you will. And I think our mindset was to be 
like we wanted to be a huge platinum band because we were seeing like Slipknot and Mudvayne and bands that were kind of heavy really start to have this like crazy success and I think a label management agents everybody had this like notion that we would be a band that did this as well so it's not that we were pressured to write hits or told to write hits but I think we we're just consciously this is what we're doing like you know we want to write these kind of songs and and be on that level um but it but I even remember in the studio like working on the guitar tone and Rob being very frustrated the tone being it's muddy you know and mm -hmm. um He's like, man, he's like, it needs to sound like fucking deicide. And he was like yelling, <laughs> yelling at Mudrock almost. And uh, I just kind of always like had that in the back of my head, that conversation. I don't even know if Rob remembers that, but um, I was like, yeah, dude, you're right. Because uh, like that's a big part of who we are, hardcore, death metal. And while we like new metal and some of these bands like Slipknot and, and Deftones and Mudvayne, I don't think that's who we really were as songwriters. We were writing better as being as heavy as we could, more like Present Darkness. Uh, and while Present Darkness has that new metal vibe, it it's more geared towards our hardcore and death metal roots. So we kind of brought that back. But the biggest sound difference, and I think that flips everybody's wig, is that it's tuned up. So it sounds more metallic off the bat because it's it's no longer a detuned seven string tuned to A or G. We're now in C or power trip. Most of the song is, you know, played in a much higher key. Um, so, you know, that's just going to sound different right off the rip as well. So that these are conscious decisions to like play the early late eighties, early nineties stuff we loved versus playing the late to late nineties, early two thousands stuff we loved. Favorite tattoo. I wanted to steer away from this, but all of a sudden it just keeps popping into my head and I can't, yeah, like, I, I'm I, mad at myself. Weird questions are fine with me. Uh, my favorite one. Well, I love this Paul Booth piece. I would be a, a ridiculous. Oh, I would be an idiot to not just right? talk about how great this is, but oh. You know, chop my arm off aside, and it is Paul's work. It's not like me and my buddy. An Frank. image and someone else. Yeah. Yeah, my buddy Frank over at Skinflix, <laughs> man, he's got this cool oh. Paul Booth fucking thing on his wall. <laughs> I was like, give me that, brother. Uh, I was uh, drunk on tour, which is a rarity for me. I guess, except unless you're talking like 2006. Uh, but <laughs> I, I just our tattoo artist. One of them was Nick Wagner. Was out on on the road with us and just tattooing some of the guys and i apparently had drunkenly said uh when i wake up i better have a fucking pirate tattoo that says yar <laughs> <laughs> i woke up with a pirate tattoo that says yar so. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> well i guess that's pretty cool that's awesome I'm gonna come oh and i, I love, love good tattoo stories yeah, yeah. That's a Dude. fun one versus like, you know, obviously having the greatest tattoo artist of all time work on you. You, do, you don't say, my man, this pirate tattoo is by far the coolest thing I got. That's <laughs> a cool story I have. <laughs> man. The fact that you got fucking work from Paul Booth, that's sick. That's sick. That's all I didn't know. I didn't know. It's an honor. He's a He came to OzFest 2003 and it was weird because I uh, had a, we had the same publicist at the time. Random. So he had uh there was a message like a on our day day sheet. So basically bands, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, but in, for those that don't, we have a day sheet which is like the idiot's guide to what's happening for the day for bands. <laughs> you are in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> it is Wednesday, you know. <laughs> the bathroom is over here. Uh stuff like that. So um, it, on that particular day, it said, Paul Booth is a fan and wants to tattoo someone in the band. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no one's seeing this yet. No one saw that. Yeah. Like, so I jumped at that. And then he and I became friends. And, uh, you know, it started off as this piece. And it's all freehand, you know. So he just basically oh, okay. took, took my vein 
and got the inspiration from there. And then he's just continued over the years. And the cool thing I thought he did was Kerry King has something where um, on his arm, on his hand, you see the face that way, but with yep. Kerry, he flips his hand and it looks a different way. So we did the same kind of. Oh, that's fucking oh, awesome. Whoa. Yeah. Different. That's fucking sick. And again, all freehand. So the guy's. That's even more insane. <laughs> yeah. It's just not. It's all nasty. Right. So. Yeah.